Greetings and salutations, friends. The time is uh, finally here. We are going to start The Horus Heresy. As previously mentioned, I will be doing two series on this particular book series. Badum Tish. Anyways, I will be doing the books themselves, which is the one you're watching right now, where I will be going over the series book by book and covering the various interesting things that happens within them, with plenty of speculations on what it might mean, might not mean, etc., and various happenstances. We will essentially be diving a bit into the lore, extrapolating, and having a little bit of fun with it. This will obviously be a somewhat ranty series, and the episodes will be quite lengthy, but... If I know my audience, that's not going to be a problem. And the second series is going to be my larger lore series take on it, where I will be covering major events, like for example the Battle of Kalth, or the Gate Betrayals of Istvan, etc, etc. Those videos, of course, are going to be considerably... Harder to plan, let's just say. Custom made art, planning it out, gathering all of the irrelevant information, making it into a somewhat coherent mess, and then trying to release the damn things. If I learned anything from the Armageddon series, it is that nothing ever goes to plan. Any lesson I really should have learned fucking ages ago, but here we are. Anyways, those will be properly scripted and planned out, unlike this series, which I plan to simply just rant my lily white little ass off. So, without further ado, let's get into it. The first book starts rather prophetically with the words, I was there the day Horus slew the Emperor. Which might just be the most blatant piece of foreshadowing I have seen in my entire life. But, I must admit, it does fit quite well. There's a certain weight to that introduction, you know, so I quite like it. And more importantly, the person telling the story is going to be rather important throughout the Horus Heresy. His name is Garviel Loken, captain of the 10th Company of the Lunar Wolves Legion, currently attached to the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet alongside Horus Lupercal himself. By the way, am I the only one who thought that Horus's last name was Lupercal rather than Lupercal? I actually looked up the Roman supposed pronunciation of it, and it is apparently Lupercal. Granted, Latin is a dead language, so God knows how it actually sounded, but it seems to be correct, as far as I can tell anyways. But let's return to the point. How the fuck, might you ask, did Horus kill the Emperor long before the events of the Horus Heresy? That seems unlikely. Well, you see, this tale belongs to a somewhat peculiar war, to put it mildly, and is being told for almost comedic effect, really, by Garvia Loken here in the beginning of the book. In fact, he stresses very specifically that he is not being serious when he says, I was there the day Horus slew the Emperor, making sure that the audience gets the joke. So, this conflict, how did it start? Well, accidentally, honestly. The 63rd Expedition happened across a system that had remained isolated so far, and the moment they translated inside the system, they were hailed over Vox frequencies. They were being greeted by the Imperium of Man, which lay at the center of a system of nine worlds and inhabited the world Terra. And to make it even more majestical, they were ruled by the Emperor. And they welcomed their brethren from the cold void of space, fellow humans come to the center of humanity's expanding empire. Together, they, the humans, would burst forth out of this isolationist part of the galaxy and conquer the galaxy in the name of the Emperor bringing the light of reason to every corner of the galaxy. I imagine that the command staff aboard the Vengeful Spirit, the flagship of the 63rd Expedition, were vaguely bemused at this point in time, trying to figure out what the odds of this were, because they would have to be long indeed. But strange as the situation was, the fact remained that they had stumbled upon a lost fragment of humanity. Now, of course, the Emperor, the actual Emperor, Crusade was designed to reunite all of these lost fragments of humanity into the Imperium of Man. Apparently the same idea that the locals had had, but the Emperor had already started expanding. In fact, at this point, he'd conquered most of the galaxy and was essentially engaged in the act 
of mopping up the last major areas of resistance, like the Great Orc Empire at Ulanor, for example. So Big E himself had a rather considerable lead on these people, but again, nevertheless, they are a lost fragment of humanity. As such, they should be brought into the Imperium peacefully, if at all possible. After all, the Imperium would like to tax these people and recruit them into its armies. Therefore, burning their homes and raping their women is usually a bad way to start a relationship. And it needs to be pointed out, by the way, that Horus Lupercal was actually quite the diplomat. He much, much preferred bringing worlds into the Imperium, and usually viewed the act of having to subdue the system as a sort of failure in and of itself. Of course, there were cases in which this was inevitable and indeed the righteous thing to do, but peace was usually preferred. Again, for the same reason that raping houses and burning women were not preferred. And so, to begin bridging the gap, Horus Lupercal dispatched his most trusted and most diplomatic lieutenant, one by the name of Hastur Sejanus, also known as the Perfect One. He was a bit of a darling of not only the 63rd Expedition, but the entire Lunar Wolves Legions, and indeed, one might go so far as to say the Crusade in its entirety. He was one of the truly great heroes of the time. And he damn well should be, he is described as literally perfect, a complete and utter Greek god in appearance, naturally. He is also kind, gentle, merciful, diplomatic, yet strong and resolute on the battlefield. He is literally Mr. Perfect. But unfortunately for Mr. Perfect, he did commit a bit of a social faux pas. He explained to the Emperor, quote unquote, that he was sent by the other Emperor, and his Emperor was better than this Emperor because his Emperor was the one Emperor, and therefore the other Emperor could not be the one and only Emperor because he only had an Emperor. God fucking damn it. Anyways, the fake Emperor decided he was insulting his honor and had him killed. Right there in his throne room, snip off with his head. Now, I gotta question just how perfect the bastard was when he met a guy who called himself the Emperor and then said, Hello, I bring greetings from the Emperor, Emperor. You what? Who do you bring greetings from? The Emperor. Wait, I'm the Emperor. No, no, not you, the real Emperor. Wait, what? The real Emperor? What am I then? The fake Emperor, obviously. Okay, fuck you very much, son. I mean, I do kind of get it. Though, in his defense, Hastur might have been a little bit distracted at that particular point in time. Now, this is a little bit in the future of the Horus Heresy, but I'm going to do this occasionally. I'm going to cover most of the books from the point of view and knowledge of the books, but this is important, and it's from a side story which I won't be covering. I'm only going to cover the main books. So, Hastur Sejanus had recently happened upon the soon-to-be corpse of a master craftsman in his chambers. This guy was famous throughout the 63rd Expedition as an absolute master jeweler, and Hastu had commissioned him to do some work for him. When he arrived, he found the master slowly choking to death. His windpipe had been crushed. Hastur, of course, immediately tried to save the man, but he was beyond saving. He could not get into a medica deck in time. And naturally, being a rather good lad, Hastu wanted to find out who had done this. The only leads he had was, one, the man's windpipe had been crushed by a single hand, as they were the indentures of five digits on his throat. Now this would require a rather prodigious feat of strength, which narrows down the suspects, although not as much as you might think on an expeditionary fleet. And two, he had died holding on to a small silver medallion, with a wolf's head emblazoned on it. Remember that, because it's going to be quite important later. Hasno did not have much time to investigate, or any time at all, actually, as they had pretty much just arrived in system, and he was sent before he could confide in anyone else. Which meant that, of course, his investigation came to a rather abrupt end. Convenient. But enough about that, with the death of Hastur Sejanus, um, diplomatic ties had been interrupted, to put it fucking mildly. Horus was outraged, unsurprisingly, but was still willing, and that was quite the act of restraint, 
to maintain diplomatic relations and a second envoy was sent, this time led by a Malaghurst. His shuttle didn't even reach the surface before being shot down by planetary defence forces and then the Imperium quote unquote, fleet attacked the 63rd expedition. And well, hostilities don't get much more obvious than that, and the 63rd expedition was forced to retaliate. Horus Lupercal immediately ordered the destruction of the Imperium's fleet, this really is going to get confusing, isn't it? And ordered an all out assault launched against Terra. Really, really is going to get confusing. Anyways, let's return to the invasion. The Lunar Wolves were famous for being shock assault specialists. They would locate the enemy's top leadership and they would ram it with everything they had, ripping their enemy's proverbial throat out with one swift and overwhelming strike. This was their preferred tactic and this was the tactic they employed against Terra. The Emperor's defenders proved to be remarkably technologically advanced, matching the invaders step for step in most cases, and in a few cases, actually superseding them in technological sophistication. The deciding difference, however, were the Astartes themselves. The Emperor's defenders might be wearing power armour and using large bore weapons similar to bolt guns, but they were unaugmented humans, wearing what was at best imitations of Astartes power armour and weaponry. They had none of the brute savagery, strength, ferocity, tactical acumen, and swiftness of thought that made the Legionis into pound for pound the most effective fighting force the galaxy had ever seen. And it would be a monstrous understatement to say that the defenders of Terra had underestimated their opponents. Their navy in orbit was horrifyingly outmatched, despite outnumbering their enemies, the 63rd expedition had several capital ships in it, which were more than a match for any navy vessel of the Imperial Navy. And the vengeful spirit herself was more than a match for a dozen of the poor little bastards, not to mention the Imperial Navy also got to experience what it was like to be boarded by Legiones Astartes, and it is very important by the way to point out we are talking about an actual legion formation here, not a chapter. The 63rd Expeditionary Force contained 20 companies of Legiones Astartes, that's 20,000 of these bastards more than enough to carry out both a ground campaign and a naval engagement. And of course, they also had elements of the Imperial Army along with them, as well as a Titan Legion, that being Legio Mortis. Against such opposition, the defenders of Terra could not stand for long, and they quickly folded. Even the Emperor's elite guards, the so-called Invisibles, named due to the fact that they possessed an ancient form of cloaking technology, capable of bending light to surround their form, effectively making them invisible, could not stop the Legiones Astartes. A slight upset, however, was that Garviel Loken, the captain of the 10th company, was the first man to reach the heart of this Imperium and face down the Emperor. He did so alone primarily for plot reasons. And just barely beating the Catulan Reavers under the command of Kalos Echidon to the Emperor's throne chamber. This was of course quite a point of pride for the 10th company to have their captain be the first one there. And a slight point of shame for the Catulan Reavers. They of course being part of the first company of the Lunar Wolves and the second part of their elite formation. The main part being under the command of the captain of the first company, that being of course Ezekiel Abaddon, and the second part being the Catalana Reavers, under Kalos Echadon. And of course, being beaten to the primary objective by the 10th company's captain, well, it did smart a little bit, but this was still back in the day when this was considered to be friendly competition, rather than something worthy of stabbing each other over. Seeing as he was quite clearly outmatched, being surrounded by some 20 demigods, the Emperor quickly surrendered, however he asked one last boon. He asked to be allowed to surrender not to some no-name captain, especially not to the captain of the 10th 
company, but to the leader of the Imperium of Mankind. Unfortunately, Big E himself was not present at the moment, so he'd have to make do with the second best, that being the commander of the force that had so violently and quickly, mind you, subjugated this once proud empire. The commander of the Catalan Reavers suggested that the old man simply be brought up to the Battle Bard's the Vengeful Spirit in irons and fuck his request, but Garvia Loken was a bit more of a softy, and he figured that they had the very least earned that much, despite their various transgressions. So he voxed up to the Vengeful Spirit and requested Horus to personally come down and receive the Emperor's surrender. A bit of a softy, that Garville Loken guy, a trait that was going to bite him very savagely in the posterior somewhere down the line, but that is for a future episode. Horus accepted and teleported down to the throne chamber. Just moments before he arrived, Garville Loken, however, noted something a little bit strange. This Emperor was old, hunched over, and defeated. Not at all the kind of guy you would expect to simply outright murder a friendly envoy, then shoot down the next envoy, and then declare open war upon a force he has no information of. Didn't seem like the kind of move such an apparently timid man would make. And it was around about this time that Garfield Loken also noticed that the throne standing in the middle of the room was oddly distorted as if something sitting upon it was bending light. It was too late to shout out a warning. The Emperor was not surrendering. He was still sitting on the Golden Throne, which turned out to be a weapon system. At the press of a button, a force field began expanding within the room, the open room, on top of a gargantuan tower, pushing Loken and the Catalan Reavers right off it, sending them falling hundreds of meters down to the pavement below. Garvia Loken was just barely able to hold on and prevent himself from being flung out of the room as Horus Lupercal fully manifested in the center of the throne room. The Empress' plan was to have the commander of the invading force called down to him, whereupon he would assassinate him, after which the enemy's invading forces would surely be thrown into chaos. However... He had severely underestimated the caliber of his opposition, not to mention the sheer fucking weight of a Primarch in full battle armor. The arcane technology worked into the Emperor's Golden Throne was not enough to move Horus Lupercal, who materialized in the room and calmly raised a plasma pistol towards the Golden Throne. Mere moments thereafter, the force field deactivated, leaving behind nothing but a charred corpse sitting upon a golden throne. And that is how Horus slew the Emperor on the planet of terror in the solar system of Sol. Now, I would be lying if I said I didn't find the symbolism a little bit heavy-handed, as in a garbage truck parked on my testicles, kind of heavy-handed, but I get the reason why. It is only a nice introduction to the book series, although I'd consider Garville's Loken remark that the Justarian Terminators being clad in black rather than the grey of the Lunar Wolves, making them appear as if they were some other black legion, at that point, we're starting to leave the realms of heavy-handed and starting to enter the realms of good old-fashioned fourth wall breaking. And speaking of the fourth wall, the Lunar Wolves 63rd Expedition was about to be assaulted by a very, very different adversary. Namely, a bunch of poets, writers, songwriters, various musicians, and all manners of nonsense. The Remembrancer Order. This motley crew had been organized and dispatched to the various expeditionary fleets on the order of Malkador the Sigilite. Their mission was simple enough. They were to remember everything about the Great Expedition, be it in the form of verse, poetry, song, pictures, paintings, or whatever else they were specialized in. The idea was quite obviously to lend an air of mystique and good old-fashioned propaganda to the Great Venture. 
or if you wish to be a little bit more charitable, to record the great deeds of the Crusade for all posterity. Unfortunately for the Rembrandts, they were not particularly welcome, as you could probably expect. Considering they are being sent out through legions of born and bred warriors who've been fighting for literal centuries, a massive influx of what was in their eyes useless civilians was not exactly well received. Technically speaking, all of the legions were supposed to receive the Rembrandts in one way or another, although some did avoid it by simply just fucking off. As simple as that. They would continuously make sure that they were out of range of the convoys carrying the Rembrandts. The rest would accept them with grudging acceptance at the very goddamn best. The Lunar Wolves were not overly fond of them, but they didn't have any open hostility either. The Space Wolves were even less fond of them, but they decided to obey with the command. On the other hand, the Death Guard were one of the legions that decided to simply not be anywhere where the Remembrances might possibly be. The Night Lords were another such legion, for rather obvious reasons. The only legions that gave them any kind of a welcome really were the Thousand Sons, who accepted them as a form of curiosity more than anything, and they viewed them as a potential tool for the future. If these Remembrances could record the Thousand Sons' great deeds and how they use their powers, then perhaps in the future this could be used as a tool to convince others that the Thousand Sons were not, in fact, hell-spawned demon monstrosities who fired lasers from their eyes, but instead shining heroes in gold-white armour. And then, of course, there is the Emperor's Children, pretty much the only legion that unreservedly welcomed these new additions, because they are, of course, very, very fond of pictures, musical pieces, and poetry about themselves. Now, with all that being said, it should also be pointed out that Remembrance's orders weren't simply just some random thing that Malkador figured out one night before going to bed. There was a real and proper reason behind it. It was to depict the Great Crusade at the height of its glory, and to communicate that depiction down the line to the civilians, to give them something to believe in, etc. It was propaganda, but it was well-meaning, quote-unquote, propaganda. And it was also meant to guarantee the warriors that was fighting the Great Crusade that they their deeds would not be forgotten. That was a point that flew right over the head of a considerable number of them, but hey, details. And even if the Remembrances were not welcomed by the Astartes, the Imperial Army elements attached to them were most definitively happy to see them, because, well, how do I put this? Being a man in the Imperial Army, or woman for that matter, was an exceedingly exciting time if you enjoy being bored out of your fucking mind 99% of the time. The life of an Imperial Army man was, generally speaking, 99.9% .9 mind-numbing boredom and various drills, and then 0.1% actual combat. The vast majority of the heavy lifting was carried out by the Astartes, and the Imperial Army was considered to be a support element. As such, only the most elite of Imperial Army units were ever actually utilised by the Astartes, the overwhelming majority of army regiments were simply utilised for stuff like a garrison duty, policing actions, and holding relatively quiet lines. And so the introduction of hundreds if not thousands of crazed bohemian artists that quickly set up shop distributing all kinds of wonderful things, including vast quantities of alcohol, were heartily welcomed by the local Imperial Army contingents. As for the Remembrances themselves, they had set out from Terra the best of their types, the finest composers, the finest artists, the finest pictographers, the absolute best of the best. Being selected for the Remembrances program was a great honour, and none would dare refuse. They set out, in many cases for years at a time, to travel out to the expeditionary fleet their heads filled with all manners of miraculous things. They would see great battles, incredible heroics, and they would make their greatest works yet. Then they arrived to what can only be described as a chilly fucking reception, and in many cases outright combative. And that is if they did arrive in the first place. Hell, some legions, not to mention names, 
threatened to outright fire on the Remembrances if they decided to get too close. To say that many an illusion were shattered in these opening moments would be a profound understatement. However, at least with the Lunar Wolves, things were about to thaw out considerably. To begin with, the Lunar Wolves were exceedingly skeptical to these new civilians, but things changed rather quickly when a young pictographer by the name of Euphrate Keeler took an iconic and masterful picture of Malaghurst. It would appear that he had not died when his shuttle was shot down, instead he was crippled for life, even as Nastartes. But his triumphant return as a phoenix rising from the flames spread like wildfire throughout the expeditionary fleet and beyond. This quickly garnered the Remembrances with considerable credibility, now that both the Astartes, the higher leadership, and the Imperial Army officers all saw that, hey, maybe these guys aren't that bad after all. And so, everything else being equal, the Remembrances were relatively welcome amongst the Lunar Wolves and were given a fair bit of access to its officers and soldiers. Now granted, when I say fair bit of access, I mean that they were given any access whatsoever. Generally speaking, most of their requests were still denied, and if they had the temerity to request to be brought down to the surface of a planet being made compliant to actually see the battles they were supposed to be remembering, they were usually told that they could shove that particular idea up a place where the sun don't shine and forget about it. Usually in somewhat more diplomatic terms, but not by much. But hey, it could have been a lot worse. Anyways, enough wibble wobble, let us return to the point. So, let us now talk about something that's actually pretty important to know based on the first book. Namely, what the fuck is a Mornival and is it tasty? Well, the answer to the first question is, it is an unofficial command body within the Lunar Wolves. It is made up of four members who are used as the War Masters, or, well, at this point, not technically the War Masters, but Horus Lupercal's personal advisors. Technically speaking, the Mournival holds absolutely no military or political power within the Legion, beyond their roles as individual captains, and in fact, they see their role in the Mournival as being in addition to, and separated from, their duties as company commanders, which is why a person in the Mournival could issue advice that would go against the interest of their company, for example. But, of course, in reality, being the four closest advisors to the boss man himself means that the body has enormous influence within the Legion. It could, in fact, be said to be the second most influential organization within the entire Legion, next to the Primarch's office itself. As for the makeup of the Mournival, it must, as mentioned, be made up of four people. These four individuals must be company captains, which kinda narrows down the possibilities. Before the rather unfortunate death of Hastu Sejanus, he was a part of the Mournival, along with Ezekiel Abaddon, Horus Aximen, and Tariq Torgarden. And yes, I must admit, I'm quite proud of my ability to recite that from memory, and as to the second question, no, in all due likelihood, the Mournival is not tasty. Space Marines are not particularly tender. The observant amongst you have probably already noticed an issue with this. If there are supposed to be four Mournival members, and Hastu Sejanus was one of them, then first and foremost, that means that introduction into the Mournival is certainly not based on IQ. Considering the aforementioned blonde guy decided it was a good idea to bitch out an emperor in his own throne room. Idiot. And the second problem is that there are now three, rather than four, members of the Mournival. So how does one go about fixing this? This is, after all, a fairly important position, because one, it does carry rather considerable political power within the Legion, and two, this is a very special body. This is pretty much the only gathering of people horrors can turn to for, shall we say, personal guidance. 
Generally speaking, being a Primarch, any and all opinions you will be receiving is going to have some form of agenda behind it, because, well, everyone has an agenda to push. By organizing the Mournival, he managed to at least to some extent sidestep this. As I mentioned, when somebody speaks in the Mournival, they do not speak from their position within the Legion, not for the first company or the tenth company or whatever. Rather, they speak from the position of an individual, offering their own opinions, which Horus considered to be extremely valuable. Now again, there is no seniority as to who gets selected for the Mournival. The captain of the second company doesn't move up the line or anything like that. There is a selection process, where the remaining members of the Mournival, as well as Horus himself, weigh in on the various candidates, and then come up with one person they wish to induct into the Brotherhood. In this case, there were several candidates, however, one came with a recommendation that none others did. At this point in time, the 63rd Expedition was joined by a small number of Imperial Fists, including their Primarch, Rogal Dorn. The Fists had been recalled to Terra to fortify the Imperial Palace and to become the Emperor's personal Praetorians. Now, this was of course a very, very honourable mission. This meant that the Emperor trusted the Fists above any other legion, as he would make them his very own guardians. But on the other hand, it also meant that the Imperial Fist would have to leave the front line, the cutting edge of the Crusade, and give up on any further accolades that might be earned. Not to mention, while all of the other legions got to finish the fight, the Fists would have to toddle off back to Terra and twiddle their thumbs for the rest of the campaign. Not exactly what a born and bred warrior would have wanted. But we'll get back to all of that at some later date, for now. Horus had requested Dawn's help in selecting a new member, and Dawn being Dawn, read through every single personnel file of every single person available to take up the position, and then finally came up with a name, after considering every last one of them, their shoe size, their personal opinions, and what they had for breakfast that morning, because Dawn, and came up with Garviel Loken, a choice that Horus himself approved of. Because, here's the thing, the Mournival is supposed to offer a certain sort of balanced advice to Horus. This means that you can't have too many warmongers on the council. You can't also have too many neutral people, etc. You need a mix of opinions to create a balance for Horus to then take under advisement. Which means that somebody essentially had to become the next Hustur Sejanus. And considering that Blonde Sejanus was very, very fond of honor and a very literal interpretation of orders, in other words, having a stick so far up his ass that it would make an Imperial Fist proud, then Garviel Loken certainly was a good choice. In fact, he was so straight-laced that he almost refused the honor of entry into the Mournival because they had a tradition with a little bit of theatrics attached to it. So, when the Mournival was originally founded, they did so in an area where the moon could be reflected in a still body of water. After that, that became a tradition. To Loken, however, this smacked of unclean heathen rituals, and he almost refused the honour due to this fact. But Tariq Torgaden managed to surgically remove the stick for but a moment at the very least, and convinced Garviel that this was all a piece of harmless theatrics, primarily based on good old-fashioned tradition. And tradition is, of course, very important, especially inside an organization as all as the Legioni Sestatis. Considering they'd been fighting across the galaxy for literal centuries at this point, they had built up quite a few of said traditions. And Tariq further argued that the Mournival's oath was no different from taking an oath of moment, for example, which is another Another Lunar Wolves tradition where every single member of the Legion that is going to be going into battle takes an oath to fulfill a personal objective. This might be to do something specific like taking an enemy commander's head or carrying out a specific objective or it might be something very general like upholding the honor of the Legion, stuff like that. 
And so, without much further ado, Garvia Loken became the fourth member of the Mournival, and therefore was admitted into Horus's Sanctum, and given direct access to the Primarch himself, which Garvia had a bit of problem with accepting to begin with. Now, this is an interesting part, so of course, Adeptus Astartes legionaries are far above normal humans, and a Primarch is as far above a legionary as he is to a human. But it's more than that. A Primarch isn't simply impressive because he's really, really large and viciously intelligent, he has an kind of charisma, a kind of attractive property that simply do not exist in mere mortals. It borders on the edge of a psychic ability, and in fact, there are speculations, especially concerning certain Primarchs, that suggest that that might actually be the case, but, well, that is more or less pure speculation. It is also the possibility that Astartes, in particular, are genetically programmed to view their Primarchs with a certain degree of extra respect. And as for the mere mortals, well, let me put it like this. First and foremost, the Primarchs are pretty much the most famous entities within the entire Imperium, only second to the Emperor himself. Secondly, they are absolutely massive, easily two to three times the size of your average man. And in addition, they are practically perfect. Their facial features are beautiful, their anatomy is quite literally flawless, although massively enlarged, and as for their intellect, it is practically beyond human understanding. We are talking about a creature here capable of making advanced spatial trajectory calculations for his entire fleet in his head. Not to mention that he also has a perfect eidetic memory, and never ever forgets anything he has ever seen or read in his entire life. And considering he also has access to pretty much every single scrap of information in the entire Imperium, yeah, he's pretty goddamn smart. You can imagine that meeting such a man would be somewhat intimidating. And there is also the fact that Horus knows everything about diplomacy and personal interactions as well. Every single trick used to get somebody on your good side, Horus knows every single one of them, and he's probably written a few books on the matter as well. And there are several examples of this throughout the first book. Horus is a consummate diplomat. He is capable of talking to people in a language they understand, and he changes his behavioural pattern to suit the person he is addressing. For example, while he is with his Mournival, he is casual, relaxed, showing them that he trusts them as the trusted aides they are supposed to be. When he is with senior military commanders, he presents a martial face, showing that he is the undisputed commander of everything he sees. But then, when he addresses them in individual manners, he points out personal things about them, being able to remember all of them, their names, their history, their actions, every last little bit, and even changes his mannerism to fit them in particular. For example, when talking to a Lord General of the Imperial Army, he will adopt the persona of an old soldier, being just a little bit camaraderie, but still maintaining that military sense of distance. Whilst while talking to the Mechanicus, he becomes very serious, very detached, almost mechanical-like, just like his opponent. Horus has a gift to put anyone and everyone at ease and make everyone feel special, welcome, and appreciated all at the same time. And the scariest thing is, this is not a natural thing to Horus. This is not a gift he was born with or some gift granted to him by the Emperor. This is his monstrous intellect at work. He calculates every single word, every single decision, every single minor movement of his body, from the tilt of his head to show subtle respect, from a certain straightening of the back to show martial pride. The way he simply sits on a stool in the presence of his Mournival, relaxed, casual, as if to say that we are all friends and equals here, despite that obviously not being the fact, and in an instance he can change modes, as we will see later. He can go from conciliary and camaraderie to strict and very, very serious in a second. 
He is a master manipulator beyond the human definition of the word. I really can't put it any more strongly than that. He's the kind of person that you don't know if he's angry when he's angry, or if he's happy when he's happy. He could literally be anything at any time, and you have absolutely no way of knowing. And if you are entirely convinced that you do know, then it was probably him that put that very certainty in your head. And we're going to get an excellent example of that statesmanship in but a moment. You see, the planet, previously known as Terra, now known as 6319, that being the 19th planet brought into compliance by the 63rd expedition, had now been judged to have been made compliant. That means that the planet has agreed to comply with the Imperium's demands. Which is basically that the entire system will be annexed by the Imperium, and over a period of time, they will be given access to all of the benefits as well as the duties of Imperial society. Taxes, tithes, manpower, etc, etc. There was only one small problem, namely the fact that 6319 was not actually compliant. Now, not to addition, there is always expected to be some resistance left after the Astartes have trod all over the place, but this was an extreme situation. There was not only localized resistance, but actually continued military and organized resistance in certain areas. Normally, this isn't really a problem. The Imperial Army would be left behind to garrison the system and take care of any idiots stupid enough to still resist the glorious might of the Imperium. In this case, however, it would appear that the Resistance was a little bit stiffer than originally anticipated. The lion's share of the Resistance was offered up by a group that had occupied an old mountain fortress known as the Whisperheads. And this was a true fortress monastery in the most literal sense of the word, in that one, it was one hell of a fortress. It was built quite literally atop a mountain, with battlements and everything required to defend it, and it was only accessible by a singular stone bridge. And secondly, it was one of the most holy places on the entire planet. Turned out that this human empire was a little bit religious, and this was pretty much the crux of their entire religion. And as such, it was fiercely defended by a large number of zealots, who was holding out against everything the Imperial Army could throw at them. This in turn made everyone else in the system think, hmm, if they can do it, maybe we can as well. As you can probably imagine, that's not the kind of sentiment you wish to have growing amongst your newly subservient population. The answer then was simple, the Whisperheads had to be mushed. However, again, it was one hell of a fortress and the Imperial Army was struggling to break it. Due to its location, they didn't have access to many of the tools they normally would have. High altitude bombers were practically useless because it was that far fucking up, they actually struggled to get enough lift to even get to the altitude, and when they were there, operating at those altitudes was trying, to put it rather mildly, and again, the Whisperheads had no shortages of defences. Additionally, the fortress was built to last, aerial bombardment had been tried unsuccessfully and costly, and bombarding it from the ground would be, well, Interesting. Imagine hauling artillery batteries up literal mountains. <laughs> it's not the kind of operation you want to be in charge of, let me tell you. And even if the Imperial Army managed to haul hundreds if not thousands of guns up a mountainside, and they managed to supply them with enough ammunition to carry out a sustained bombardment, there was no guarantee that was going to destroy anything. The fortress was built as a literal fortress and modernized. They would require an absolutely absurd amount of firepower to dent it, and even after having broken it open, the fortress was expected to carry on deep within the mountain itself. Basically, the Imperial Army could bombard the place for literal decades, and they still wouldn't be sure that they've rooted out all of the bad guys. And unsurprisingly, the Imperial Army didn't have decades. And as for storming the damn thing, well, as mentioned, there was one bridge, otherwise you had to climb, and, um... You're gonna have a relatively hard time breaking into a f mountain top fortress monastery by climbing the near sheer cliff walls. 
and marching large bodies of men across a long stone bridge straight into the teeth of machine guns, well, you can imagine how well that works out. The final option then would be to starve the buggers out. Unfortunately, no one had the faintest clue about how much food they had available inside the fortress monastery, and they knew they had access to water from a spring. So that could also take a while, to put it mildly. And again, time was not on the Imperium's side. Now, you might think, well, this is easy enough, send down the legions and they'll overrun the place in a jiffy. And yes, it would be, but here's the thing. The planet had been declared compliant, which meant it was now the duty of the Imperial Army to take care of it. The Legionis Astartes were very rarely used for garrison duty unless the system was expected to receive considerable attention from large numbers of enemy forces. There were of course exceptions, at which point Astartes were used for extended garrison duty, as was for example the case with the Death Guard, but it was pretty goddamn rare. And in the case of a situation where the Imperial army had already been handed control, it would almost certainly be seen as an insult to interfere in their business. It would essentially be the Lunar Wolves looking down at the poor army men and go, ha, so you can't even deal with one paltry, ridiculously heavily fortified mountaintop monastery? Ha 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 ha, weaklings. And since Horus really, really wanted to get moving again, he needed to find a way to justify sending legionaries down to the planet to mop up this last piece of resistance without insulting the Imperial Army. And he used his Mournival, or more precisely, Garviel Loken, for this precise thing. Now that Garviel was a part of the Mournival, he could attend the high-level briefings, usually attended by only the highest ranking amongst the Legionaries' expedition. But as the member of the Mournival, he could stand by with the rest of them. And so, after Horus and the rest of the War Council, including the Mournival, had been briefed on the situation, Horus said that this was indeed a bit of a problem, but what to do, what to do, as he gave uh, Loken a meaningful glance. And I wish to point out, Horus hadn't spoken to Loken about this specifically before. Loken had been told to be ready when his time came, but that was about it. So when Horus glanced in his direction, Loken didn't really know what was expected of him. Yet he stood forth and he simply gave his opinion. In his opinion, the Tenth Company had failed. They had been ordered to subdue all resistance, and clearly, there was still resistance on the planet. Therefore, the planet could not be considered to be fully compliant, and in such a scenario, he would ask the Imperial Army's commander for permission to take down the Tenth Company and finish the job. Horus had been banking on the fact that Loken was a very honourable man, and would probably want to properly finish what he had started. And now that Loken had suggested that he would finish what he had started, he had given the Imperial Army Commander a way to not only save face, but appear gracious in allowing the Tenth Company to take care of this problem that was technically their problem to take care of. Horus had got everything he wanted. The Tenth Company departed immediately to take out the Whisperheads, and the Imperial Army, far from being insulted, was actually grateful that not only had they saved face, they had also been allowed to appear magnanimous. Additionally, it gave Horus back a certain amount of control over the battlefield situation. Because again, here's the thing. If the Imperial Army was left to do this, they probably could do it. The problem is, it would take considerably longer, as in all due likelihood, secondary and tertiary revolts would spring up, inspired by the actions at the Whisperheads. This would then lead to a wider war, necessitating a stronger Imperial response. And, well, Horus hadn't come all this way simply to grind yet another human civilization into dust. Horus was of the opinion that when they found a human civilization, they should leave it better than they had found it, and that that was the only way to ensure they would stay loyal. Horus was of the opinion that every time they had to be heavy-handed with the civilian population, they only bred resentment, 
and by extension, further resistance, which is pretty much exactly what would happen. Horus was pretty smart when he came to these things, and I do believe he genuinely thought as well that these worlds were human worlds, and they were worthy of his protection. Of course, again, the wider goals of the Imperium had to be taken into consideration, but I really do believe that Horus wanted these wars to be as humanitarian as possible, and as soft as possible. Now, granted, his theory was also that the only humane war is a swift war, and the only swift war is a vicious and brutal one, but to be entirely honest, that is probably a correct assumption. The more vicious and violent a war is, the shorter it is also likely to be. And speaking of brutal and vicious warfare, the Remembrances, or at least a few of them, were about to get their wish. They had been asking to be taken down to actually see the battlefield for a very long time, and had been told no, 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 and fuck off many, many, many times. However, on this occasion, a small group of Remembrances were selected to go down and accompany the Tenth Company. Now, by accompany, I mean they would sit several kilometers away from the objective, and watch the pretty flashes on the horizon, but still, it was the closest they'd come so far. One of the Remembrances was Euphrate Keeler, which had already made a name for herself, and they were to be accompanied by a famous iterator by the name of Kirill Sindeman. A iterator is essentially a propaganda officer. It is their job to make sure that the glory of the Imperium comes across loud and clear to any subjugated population. And amongst their ranks, Kirill Sindeman was the absolute finest of them all. And he was to accompany the Remembrances to make sure they remembered the correct things. But what about the company they had come to actually observe? The 10th Company was being deployed in usual battle order in full strength. Additionally, Loken had been offered the services of the First Company's Terminator Elites, the Black Armored Justarians, but Garville reminded Abaddon that this was the Tenth Company's fight, to which Abaddon replied that he would inform Falcus Kibre, the leader of the First Company's Terminator Elite, that he and his Terminators were just not needed. To which Loken replied with shock, fearing that he might have somehow insulted Abaddon or Falcus Kibre, a fairly august member of the Legion. But Abaddon was swift to point out that he was actually just kidding with Loken. I feel this is necessary to point out, because turns out Ezekiel Abaddon actually used to have a sense of humor. Huh. <laughs> Who'd have thunk? Anyways, the Tenth Company was deployed to the planet in full strength, but with one change. Now that Garville was part of the Mournival, he could not always guarantee that he would be there in person to lead the Tenth Company and to take care of the various administrative duties that is expected of a captain. As such, he felt it necessary to appoint a proxy to take care of these duties in his absence. Now, normally, the number two guy is decided via seniority, and in the case of Garviol taking a bolt round to the face, that would be the case. However, in this somewhat unusual circumstance, Garviol decided to appoint a proxy rather than simply pass it down the line. This meant that the number two man, a Savior Jubal, was passed over for promotion in favor of a younger line officer by the name of Nero Vippus. He was personally trusted by Garviol Loken, and he also thought that he was suitable for the task at hand. And again, while this was unusual, there was nothing wrong with doing this, although, of course, within a legion where personal pride, prowess, and of course experience are so highly valued, it was rather inevitable that this would be taken as an insult for the guy who had been passed over. To try and smooth ruffled feathers, Garviel gave Xavier Jubal the honor of leading the assault. This was usually reserved for the highest ranking officer in attendance, which means Loken. And by giving this the most important and honorable task to Jubal, he hoped to cut short any potential miscontent. And as for the assault itself, well, it really wasn't that interesting. The Whisperheads might have proven a near impregnable fortress against the Imperial Army, but for the Astartes, it really wasn't much of a challenge. 
The single stone bridge, guarded by mortars, machine guns, and countless small arms, had proved to be a virtually unbreachable bottleneck for the Imperial Army. For the Legione Sestatis, they simply just walked across. Quite literally. While the enemy's munitions simply just bounced harmlessly off their battle plate. And once they were inside the monastery, that was pretty much game over for its defenders. Most of these were not regular military troops, there were some that had managed to escape, but the vast majority were religious zealots, with second-hand and civilian weaponry, none of which had any real hope of scratching Astarte's battle plate. Not to mention, these were normal humans against Astartes in close quarters combat. Yeah, it's about as unfair as it actually gets. Indeed, within a couple of hours, the entire monastery had been cleared of resistance for the loss of precisely zero Astartes. The whole damn thing had gone so smoothly that it was almost disconcerting. In fact, the only problem they'd run into was some minor Vox interference that started once they entered low orbit. Apparently, the defenders of the Whisperheads must have been in possession of some serious electronic hardware, as they were able to interfere with the Astartes Vox channels. They managed to superimpose a looping track of what was assumed to be religious propaganda, referring to a Samus creature. Now, in local folklore, Samus was essentially the devil. He was Satan, basically. And the looping track kept insisting that Samus was here. Samus is the man next to you. Look out, Samus is here. It was simply assumed to be some form of religious propaganda, and it was certainly unnerving in that it kind of laced itself beneath the usual bandwidth chatter. You could hear it constantly, but it wasn't like it wasn't quite there, almost ethereal, ghosty like. It would probably have been quite unnerving for the local population, and even the Imperial Army members nearby weren't particularly fond of it. They had reported that they'd been receiving these transmissions on and off for as long as they'd been up there, but nothing quite this constant. The Astartes, on the other hand, didn't give the faintest fucking shit. They were Legionis Astartes, and some random religious nonsense was not going to scare them much. It was, however, interesting that the locals were in position of technology capable of screwing with their communications network, and so they were very interested indeed in locating and perhaps figuring out how it worked. As such, combat squads were sent down into the depths of the fortress monastery to try and locate the Vox equipment. One of the squads that reported back was Xavier Jubal's squad, which told Loken that he should probably come down and see this. And that was it. I feel like I should edit in a ping sound here, but I'm gonna resist the impulse. And that is because Garviel really did need to see this. So, when he was called down into the bowels of the fortress monastery, he found Xavier Jubal standing over the corpses of his squad. Considering that no casualties had been reported, this seemed slightly unusual. All jokes aside, we do need to talk about something before moving on. At this point in time, the idea of Astartes fighting Astartes was not only ridiculous, but virtually impossible. It just... it wasn't a thing that could happen. In fact, later on in the book series, we will hear of a certain Ultramarine who received censor for merely thinking the thought. Saying that Astartes could ever fall upon Astartes was much like saying a waterfall could suddenly start flowing upwards. It just wasn't a thing that could happen, and yet, Xavier Jubal had apparently done just that. Somewhat worried for what had happened, Loken ordered parts of his squad to apprehend Jubal, assuming that something horrible must have happened, some kind of psychic weapon perhaps. But Jubal wasn't done yet as he calmly raised his bolt pistol and shot both of the Astartes accompanying Loken. Loken himself only survived by instinctively throwing himself away. 
What followed was a brief but exceedingly unusual fight. Loken tried to wrestle Jubal's weapons away before realizing that Jubal didn't need weapons. He was starting to change and mutate, splitting his battle plate asunder with the force of his mutations. Now again, this was the battle plate that was just recently withstanding heavy caliber ammunition without so much as a scratch. The fact that Loken even managed to wound and drive the beast off was remarkable in and of itself, but eventually he managed to stab the thing, which didn't kill it, but it made it run away. The thing that had been Jabal ran upwards inside of the fortress monastery, arriving just in time to see a couple of remembrances arriving. They had snuck away from their guard detail. They had been held back because they had been told that there were some complications or over at the monastery. They had decided to sneak in since they would be denied entry and they really wanted to see this battlefield they had been promised. They uh, got considerably more than they had bargained for. One of the remembrances were killed outright by the monster that had been Jabal moments before it was stopped by masked Baltifier from some 20 Astartes. Afterwards, the entire incident was quietened down as much as possible. The exceedingly heavy casualties, two full squads, which would have been considered heavy in a full-scale military engagement against major resistance centers, was explained away by the apparent fact the rebels had gotten their hands on some heavy weapons, and this information had not been available to the Astartes. As such, they had been caught unawares. Pretty much everyone who heard that explanation was um, skeptical, to put it mildly. Astartes do not get caught unawares. And as for Jubal, well, the beast he had become was explained away as a local animal. However, this explanation, as you can probably imagine, was found to be a little bit lacking by quite a few, including the Remembrances who had seen it, and Loken, who was most definitively not convinced, unfucking surprisingly. After the battle was over, the Warmaster himself came down to the surface after having Garvil taken away to a private room. He had also sent down Ezekiel Abaddon, and presumably his first company. This was quite the big move on his part, almost as if he was thinking that maybe, just maybe, he had a bit of a problem on his hands here that might require a military solution. Luckily, it didn't come to that. In private, the Warmaster explained to Loken that what he had seen was a demon. And in this case, demon is being used as a bit of a catch-all term. Now, at this point in time, we are also told that Loken and his company, and indeed the Legion, had on multiple occasions previously fought the Densians of the Warp. Now, apparently, this information about demons, you know, being able to exist in the real world, appears to be commonplace. What most people don't know, however, is that these creatures are not mindless spawns of the warp. Indeed, they are, at the very least, to a certain degree, intelligent, although not considered to be entirely sentient by the Imperium at that point in time. Which sounds a little bit self-contradictionary, but here's the thing. The wider Imperium considered these demons to be natural phenomenons, essentially. They were creatures of the warp, things that lived in the warp, and occasionally they could break into our world. They were, quite literally, a natural phenomenon. There was no planning behind it, no intelligence, nothing like that. It was just simply a thing that happened, like hurricanes or earthquakes. The Warmaster knew more about it, but he still considered them to be primordial forces. They did possess a certain low cunning and base intellect, but they acted entirely on intelligence. He was not yet, apparently, aware of the gods in the warp. He ascribed a certain level of intelligence, as mentioned, to the greater demons, for example, and even the smaller ones, but these were not the... how should I put it? the intelligence that we would consider intelligence. The Warmaster did not consider these demons to be sentient. Instead, they were, again, essentially a force of nature, but 
capable of a certain level of planning, which required intelligence, which is why they could manipulate our world and weak-willed people. This is what he told Loken, that this demon thing had essentially been able to lay a trap for Jubal, and considering Jubal was very angry after having been passed over for promotion, that anger might have been the chink in his mental armour that allowed the demon to seep its essence into Xavier Jabal. Basically, he told Loken that at that point, Jabal was no longer Jabal, he was a being of the warp. Horus further went on to explain that this was being kept a secret from the Imperium at large because of the threat it might pose, and the fact that the Emperor did not have a solution as of yet. He even shared with Loken that the reason why the Emperor had left the Great Crusade at Ulanor and headed back home was not because he'd gotten sick of fighting, but because he was heading back home to find an actual solution to the problem that was the warp. He also appeared to be a little bit disappointed, perhaps, or maybe even I'd go so far as to say slightly wounded by the fact that the Emperor had not seen fit to bring Horus along with him, and not even bring him in on his secrets. After all, Horus was now War Master. What possible reason could the Emperor have of keeping anything secret from him, his finest son? He clearly was a little bit hurt by that, but anyways, explanation over. Loken now had a much better idea of what had happened, and he promised to keep it all a secret since this was obviously highly classified information. And with that done, all resistance on the planet had finally been crushed at a slightly heftier price than... Uh, necessary, but still, it was all done, and the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet could leave the system and head back to the Great Crusade at large, and just in time as well as they received a distress call from a Blood Angels Expeditionary Fleet. Apparently, the Sons of Sanguinius had bitten over more than they could chew, and were sending out an urgent distress signal. Naturally, the 63rd Expedition was honor-bound to respond and set off immediately. Whilst all of this was going on, Garvia Loken had one last solemn duty to carry out. Cleaning out the cells of the Legionaries lost in the Whisperheads. Including, of course, the personal effects of Xavier Jubal. Now, the Lunar Wolves were a fairly spartan chapter. They lived in small private rooms called cells, and they didn't own much. Mostly maintenance equipment for taking care of their armor. A few personal trophies, perhaps, maybe a book or two they were particularly fond of, but that was about it. No lavish rooms for the Emperor's finest. In Jubal's room, however, Garvia Loken came across something unusual. A small silver medallion engraved with a wolf's head. Loken already had his suspicions about what this could be. He had heard rumors of so-called warrior lodges within the Legion. This was a tradition that had been swirling around the various legions for quite some time, but had never really been openly accepted anywhere, except for one exception, which we'll get to later. This meant that the Lodgers had to operate in secret, and Loken was not very fond of secrets. And a secret organization operating in secret inside the Legion, with a secret list of members that can only be identified by secret medallions, well, that's about as secret as it gets. And now he found a Lodge medallion in the locker of somebody who had turned into a demonic being before his very eyes. Somewhat... Suspicious, yes? Might the two have something in common? A secret society nobody knows anything about, and a battle brother turning into a raving lunatic. Loken wished to launch an investigation, but before he could do so, he was contacted by a member of the Mournival, Horus Aximund himself. And he showed Loken a small silver medallion with a wolf's head engraved upon it. Aximund invited Garviel to come attend a Lodge meeting. He knew he had discovered that Jubal was part of the Lodge, and he admitted as much, and wanted Loken to be informed before he launched any official actions. 
Had the invitation come from pretty much anyone else, Loken would almost certainly have refused, but... Horus Aximand was not only an honored brother of the Mournival, he was also a figure of some awe and respect to Loken. He had been a part of the Mournival for a very long time, and was a famous figure within the Legion. As such, Loken figured that he could trust him as an honorable individual, and decided to follow him to this Lodge meeting. And what manner of devilry befell Loken in that secretive place? Well, you're gonna have to wait a little bit to find that out. These videos are uh, fairly long, so I'll be splitting them up into parts. It won't be too long, it is Christmas after all. So until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.